I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, invasive species can be several different things, whether plants or animals, and we've got some of both today. Yeah, you know, these are topics we talk um, frequently about here, and uh, we brought in two experts to um, kind of help illuminate some of these issues. Um, we're going to hear first from um, Terry Brungis from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. She's working on the uh, their wild pigs eradication task force, so uh, we'll learn about that and what she's been doing. She's actually coming to us live from McGoffin County where she's out doing some um, scouting right now. So we'll, we'll check in with Terry here in just a few minutes um, and hear from her. And then we have Jess Slade from the Arboretum, which is here in Lexington, but it's also the State Botanical Garden of Kentucky. And Jess is the native plants curator over there. But one of the things she's challenged with are invasive species. You know, we have a lot of invasive species, especially in our urban populations. And Jess can attest to that, I'm sure. And um, But we're going to talk a little bit with Jess about kind of how she manages with it, maybe some of her philosophy. Um, and then we'll have both Matthew Springer and Dr. Ellen Crocker um, with us as well today. So just delighted to have you all with us. If you have any questions, you can use the chat function to interact with us and um, we'll get some, your questions to our experts. Um, but Renee, I'm just delighted to be with you today. Yes, definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Terry, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Hi, welcome to the show. We greatly appreciate you being on today. Thanks for having me. Terry. Tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today. Okay, well, um, basically I'm the wild pig biologist for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and today I was going to just share um, background information on wild pigs, how wild pigs got here in Kentucky, and, and our efforts to eradicate them. All right, sounds great. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, I'll get that video rolling. Hello, my name is Terry Brungis. I'm the wild pig biologist for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Today, I'd like to talk to listeners about wild pigs in Kentucky. Wild pigs are one of the greatest challenges facing natural resource professionals and landowners today. They are the ultimate invasive species. They can eat anything, live anywhere, and they have astounding reproductive potential. Kentucky, like many states, has a task force that specifically deals with wild pig issues. The Kentucky Wild Pig Eradication Task Force is a group of professional organizations. Our focus is eradication of wild pigs. Our mission statement is to eliminate the impacts of wild pigs on native fish and wildlife populations, on wildlife habitat, forests, agriculture, and property through adaptive science-based management actions that will eradicate existing wild pig populations and prevent the establishment of new populations. So what is a wild pig? Wild pigs are invasive pest species that pose serious threats to ec ec ecosystems. They have high reproductive potential and they have high intelligence. Basically, they're the smartest animal in the woods. Here's a comparison of Eurasian boar and a domestic pig. Wild pigs in Kentucky are generally hybrids of these two. Although some feral pigs are simply loose domestics or abandoned pot-bellied pigs that have become feral. All of these pigs, domestic or Eurasian, are the same species, so scrofa. Pure Eurasian boar are only present in a few small isolated pockets in the northeast U.S., maybe some in Canada. Uh, northern states in Canada's wild pigs have more Eurasian boar ancestry, and southern states tend to see pigs with a higher content of domestic genetics. Wild pigs are extremely prolific. They can reach sexual maturity at five to 10 months of age. Females can ferry twice a year and they have large litter sizes. Hybrid wild pigs have large litter sizes due to their domestic pig genetics. Domestic pigs were selectively bred to produce large litters and maximize reproduction. In Kentucky, we generally see three to eight piglets per litter, but that can be higher. Wild pigs cause damage to a multitude of wildlife, agricultural, and natural resources. They outcompete native wildlife species for food. They're especially fond of acorns, preventing deer and turkey from accessing an important fall and winter food source. Deer and turkey generally avoid areas occupied by pigs. 
As a result of this, hunter harvest can be impacted. As you can see by this top middle picture, ag damage is a guarantee in areas with pigs. This cornfield was destroyed in less than a week by one sounder of pigs. It was approximately five acres. So in this area, many farmers had to stop planting corn due to the losses they were experiencing from wild pigs. Wild pigs also impact forest regeneration by pulling up seedlings and trampling plants or rooting up the soil. Wetlands can be degraded through siltation and fecal deposition, and sensitive communities and imperiled species are especially at risk. Wild pigs prey on a variety of native wildlife, including small mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and occasionally deer fawns. They are proficient nest predators of bobwhite quail and turkey, which could exasperate population declines. Wild pigs carry up to 45 diseases and parasites. Two diseases of concern are pseudorabies and swine brucellosis. Kentucky swine industry is a pseudorabies and swine brucellosis free state as far as domestic pigs are concerned. However, a small percentage of wild pigs in Kentucky have tested positive for these diseases. Another disease that's on everyone's mind today is chronic wasting disease, also known as CWD. In 2017, a study conducted by Moore et al. found that domestic hogs were susceptible to CWD through oral exposure. And this gives rise to the question of whether feral swine living in CWD endemic regions could become infected with CWD, especially if uh, following consumption of infected cervid carcasses or just sharing contaminated environments. We don't have the answers to that yet. That's definitely concerning. Kentucky is making progress in our eradication efforts. USDA Wildlife Services partners with us uh, on trapping and aerial operations, and their efforts have been key to wild pig removal and eradication in Kentucky. Kentucky's been delisted recently from a level three to a level two by the National Feral Swine Damage Management Program. That program um, ranks each state as far as wild pig numbers. And that's, uh, that reduction is due, that delisting is due to reductions in all populations across our state. So we were a level three, which was 10,000 to 100,000 wild pigs. And now we're down to level two, which is 1,000 to 10,000. So even though Kentucky is making progress, the real issue throughout the wild pig range is illegal release. Most of Kentucky's wild pig populations are not the result of natural expansion. Populations are the result of illegal releases with the intention to create hunting opportunities. In 2012, Statute KRS 15186 was created to prohibit importation and release of wild pigs. This was a step in the right direction. However, it's very difficult to catch a person in the act of transporting or releasing pigs. Please note uh, the statute. Uh, Accidental escape of domestic pigs is exempt from citation. So we have laws that prohibit importation and release of wild pigs, but we also have a year-round season, a year-round hunting season, that is. So say you're a pig hunter. How do you hunt pigs if there are none in your area? You might decide to import and release some. And this is what we're seeing in Kentucky. New populations are constantly appearing, threatening our progress. And so the bottom line is that misguided hunters are releasing wild pigs to create hunting opportunities at the expense of wildlife, the environment, agriculture, and property. Let's look at what happened in Tennessee when a hunting season was created for wild pigs. So looking at the top map, in 1950, Tennessee had two disjunct breeding populations of wild pigs. By 1999, looking at the second map, these two populations had grown, but they were still only two populations. In 1999, it became legal to hunt pigs as a big game species. Now look at the 2010 map. With the change in legal status, pigs spread across the state. Misguided hunters, excited about the new hunting opportunity, started moving pigs as pig hunting grew in popularity. So for 49 years, there were only two populations of wild pigs. 
with the change in game status, Tennessee became overrun with wild pigs in just 11 years. Now let's look at some research. Historically, states like Tennessee have liberalized hunting seasons in an effort to provide the greatest opportunity to control wild pigs. But this backfires just like it did in Tennessee. In fact, the liberal hunting opportunity is the primary factor responsible for hastening human influence spread of pigs across the U.S. Other research shows the movement of wild pigs through human-mediated activities is the primary catalyst for the accelerated range expansion we've seen during the last decade or so. And more research shows the popularity and subsequent expansion of wild pig distribution is a direct result of individuals wishing to create hunting opportunities through introductions. So we've talked about how hunting creates incentives for illegal importation and release. Now let's talk about hunting as an eradication tool. Wildlife agencies often ask hunters to shoot more does in areas with high deer densities to help control populations. However, this strategy doesn't work with wild pigs. Hunting as an eradication tool is simply not effective. It is actually counterproductive to agency eradication efforts. Shooting into a sounder may remove one or two. However, it educates the rest. Remember when I said wild pigs are the smartest animal in the woods? They won't stick around when shot at. Hunting and shooting disperses pigs to new areas. Oftentimes, the sounder breaks up and goes in different directions. So with their reproductive potential, by the time we locate these pigs again, they've often doubled in numbers. So as you can see, the year-round season contributes to an increase in wild pig numbers by providing incentives to release pigs. And once they're here, shooting at them educates them to avoid detection. So what is an effective eradication strategy? While hunting preferentially removes adult males, the wild pig team uses an adaptive scientific management plan that preferentially removes females of all ages and focuses on whole cylinder removal. This adaptive management plan has successfully eradicated several populations in Kentucky, including a population in Henry County where we have two male boars left. We have a, had a population um, the, in the Pond River area in Hopkins and Muhlenberg counties that's been eradicated, a population in Scott County, and a population in the Obion Creek area was also eradicated, as several more populations were as well. Now take a look at the invasion curve. In the introduction stage, eradication is simple. Look at the bottom left of the screen. Um, eradication as you move up the line is still feasible in the detection stage, but by the time the public is aware of the problem, it's usually too late. Um, the red area indicates that eradication is futile. Think uh, Texas, the Texas apocalypse. Texas has a millions of pigs, and many states south of Kentucky are also in the red. So those states are focusing not on eradication, but on minimizing damage. Um, Kentucky is basically in the detection stage um, where eradication is still feasible, so we can fully eradicate pigs in Kentucky. Um, I believe public awareness began early in Kentucky thanks to agency efforts and thanks to our farmers who brought the attention uh, to us when they experienced ag damage. In 2019, the department, with the support of the Kentucky Wild Pig Eradication Task Force, launched a media campaign asking the public to report, don't shoot or hunt wild pigs. I know what this sounds like, asking our hunters to help us eradicate wild pigs by not hunting or shooting them, sounds crazy. But hunting isn't going to eradicate pigs. In fact, according to Dr. Kurt Verkateron, a research wildlife biologist with the National Wildlife Research Center and one of the nation's top wild pig experts. In his book, Invasive Wild Pigs of North America, hunting has never eliminated a wild pig population. So, yes, we are asking the public to help us eradicate pigs by not hunting them. 
So Kentucky has the opportunity, like I said, to fully eradicate wild pig populations due to aggressive trapping efforts. Pig numbers are the lowest they've been in a decade in Kentucky. However, continued illegal releases threaten to unravel all our hard work. So we must remove incentives to release. This means we must prohibit wild pig hunting. There's no reason to release wild pigs if you can't hunt them. Many states with small scattered pig populations like Kentucky have already banned pig hunting and it's working. Kansas and Nebraska were two of the first states to ban pig hunting in the late 90s and early 2000s. Kansas uh, spends the majority of their efforts stopping pigs from crossing the Oklahoma-Kansas border, and wild pigs in Nebraska are completely eliminated. New York banned pig hunting in 2014, while pigs were only present in a few counties, and they've totally eliminated them as well. Tennessee banned pig hunting recently, and they're seeing declines in agricultural areas. Missouri also recently banned wild pig hunting uh, on their Department of Conservation-owned lands, and they are seeing a 60% reduction in wild pig presence in watersheds. Canada also put a ban in place. Pigs are not yet established there, so they've gone on and put the ban in place ahead of time. So we have all the pieces to the puzzle except a ban on sport hunting of pigs. We have a media campaign that has encouraged public support and landowner cooperation. We have excellent partnerships. We have an adaptive scientific management plan that uses aerial operations and trapping as a key eradication tools. A ban on sport hunting would remove incentives to illegal importation and release. That is the final piece to the puzzle. In conclusion, wild pigs can be eradicated from Kentucky by removing incentives for illegal release. So this is a discussion item at the next commission meeting on March 3rd. The district commissioners will be provided this information to allow them to make a decision on this. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that process or being a part of that, you can go to fw.ky.gov. You can find information to contact your district commissioners. If you're interested in letting them know uh, what you think about this, um, you can also feel free to contact me at my email address, terry.brunches at ky.gov. But um, we just we are looking for support to help us to protect Kentucky's wildlife, natural resources, agriculture, and livestock from invasive wild pigs. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Terry. We greatly appreciate you uh, joining us. And, um, you know, one thing I was wondering if you want to turn your camera back on. Um, one thing I was wondering is, like, are there specific, just like specific counties that have worse problem than other counties? But or is it like Kentucky in general has a bad issue with pigs? We, we do have a uh, small scattered populations throughout the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, all of Kentucky is not full of pigs. Uh, which does give us the opportunity to eradicate them. Uh, but the fact that these uh, small scattered populations are very far apart from each other, that's indicative of illegal release. They did not walk. They did not naturally expand to these locations. They were driven in via truck and trailer. And what's the best way, I mean, if someone has pigs on their property, then what should they do? Should they call somebody? Should What what steps should they take? Okay. You said shooting is not a yeah. good idea. So, Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, people can go to our website at fw.ky.gov and type in wild pigs in the search bar. And we have a wild pig, so we have a wild pig website. There's actually a, a report button. So if you have wild pig problems, uh, or you've seen damage for pigs, you can click on that report button and that will send an email directly to me. Uh, so if you don't have, uh, don't want to fool with the website, you can call our number 800-858-1549 and ask for me or just ask for the wild pig biologist and I can take a report over the phone. Uh, we, uh, we try to trap the whole sounder of pigs, which is a group of related females that all live together. Uh, so we try to trap the whole group so as none of them are left on the landscape to become trap shy or to be educated. So, uh, but yeah, you can, we, we are asking the public to report to our website. 
and then we can offer our services. Terry, I was going to say I did post it in our chat function so folks can see the, the website direct link there. Great. Thank you. So, so Terry, um, when you say we are going to we try to trap all of those, you mean that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife comes out and, and does that service free of charge for any of the landowners, correct? Yes, and uh, USDA Wildlife Services are partners. Um, they have um, four to five uh, specialists stationed throughout Kentucky, and their job is to uh, trap wild pigs. So we work in partnership with them, and uh, they're a without. We couldn't do this without them. They're a huge help. And so I'm gonna that? go oh. ahead. I was going to say, I'm going to toot Terry's horn here a little bit and the entire wild pig task force between that relationship <laughs> with USDA, because that that being downgraded from level three to level two is actually a really big deal. It, it just points, uh, highlights the success that Terry has had in that role and that, and that entire group uh, working together. Um, you know, there's various members, including USDA, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Farm Bureau's active member um, and several other groups that I'm, I'm missing here, um, uh, Land Between Lakes uh, and, and a few others. Um, so that that group really has been a success story um, throughout the country in terms of wild pig management, uh, which has gotten Terry on a few uh, committees, unfortunately, that she didn't want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, you might walk through the process of what a landowner might anticipate if they call and try to get pigs trapped on their property, what what do they have to go through to actually get these pigs trapped? <laughs> well, uh, I, that's probably a better question for Terry because she's the one that sometimes is out there setting up the traps. But um, initially, you know, getting a hold of Terry is step one. Um, you know, and that's if you think you have a pig or or even you know a remote chance, um, you definitely want to try to get a hold of her uh, as quick as possible because the sooner you can get on them, the better your chances are to stop the problem. Um, and stop it from spreading. Uh, so I'll let Terry kind of walk through the rest of the process there. Yeah, um, we, we will conduct a field visit. Um, yeah, uh, you, most of the time, the best thing is that there are hunters in the woods have their own trail cameras out. And I have 10 to 30 cameras. Well, we've got thousands of cameras out across the state. So they'll send me, they'll email me pictures or they'll text me pictures of wild pigs. So that's the best thing to do or of damage. And then, so if we uh, believe we have wild pigs or the possibility of wild pigs on a property, we'll go out, look, look for the area. And if we do find pig damage or an area that's suspect, we would set a camera, put some bait out and uh, see, see if we can get pigs on bait. If we can get them on bait, then we're gonna go back out and set a, set a trap and try to trap that whole group. So, uh, but we'll be watching those cameras. Our cameras are cell activated so we can see them. We don't have to walk in and switch out the card. We can see them from our computer or our phones and uh, be able to do that. But yeah, when we, we, we need to get them on bait. We need to see if they're there. We need to check the damage and then we can set a trap and get them out of there. Yeah. To be honest. No, oh, sorry. I was going to ask, oh, there's no cost to the landowners for this, is there? That is correct. It's it's no cost to them. Um, we just ask for permission to get rid of them. Ninety five percent of Kentucky is privately owned, and so that's where the pigs are. Is there a certain amount of pigs you have to have before you will come out? Like is it no um, or under well, <laughs> one pig? We are, the magic yeah. number. <laughs> that works. Yeah, we are preferentially removing females, so I do have a population that we eradicated six hundred pigs in, but we have two males left. Uh, we've been monitoring it for three years and found no more females. These two pigs are extremely trap shy. We've had trouble catching them, but we, we do know at least they're not reproducing. So uh, we're, not, we're not focused on them right now uh, just because we've, we're, we're trying to catch them, but we can't. So uh, we are focused on those areas that we know there's females. Yeah, the, the, when you're overwhelmed, you got to pick, pick and choose uh, resources and um, you, you brought up trap shyness and I know that the you know there's there's you know nothing smarter in the woods than a pig and then there's nothing harder to catch than a pig that's already been in a trap um, so if you do come out you know it's one of those things where having them um, run the show in terms of trapping and removing is really important because the, the experience that they have and the success that they have um, you know kind of will build uh, whereas if a landowner tried to, to catch uh, some wild pigs and, and they make one small little error and, you know, all the good intentions, 
those pigs are probably going to be almost impossible to catch the rest of their time they're alive. So it's, it's, it is a, um, a highly uh, resource um, burning uh, time, you know, in terms of Terry's life here, but it, it's also yeah. highly efficient relative to like having everybody else try to do it. So. Yeah. Well, Terry, as a lover of Kentucky woodlands, thank you for the work that you all are doing because I've seen some of the damage they can do to our woods and to our regeneration. And um, so thank you and, and, and Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources for all the great work you all do. You're very welcome. Excellent. All right. Well, Terry, you'll have to come back and see us and give us an update um, on how- I sure will. Going. When you, you catch know. those two pigs. <laughs> yes, know. I cannot wait. I'm having a party when we get ready. <laughs> <laughs> thank you hey thanks much and keep up the great work thanks thank you so now we're going to move on to another invasive <laughs> and you would think that animals could move a lot faster than plants but i think jess and um, dr crocker will be telling us that invasive plants can move pretty quick too unfortunately oh yeah for sure and this session is all about invasives uh so we've got to move into the invasive plants which sometimes go hand in hand with other invasives be they animals or tiny little animals insects <laughs> uh, they can you know uh, kind of act together and damage areas and we talk about invasives a lot on the show, invasive plants. We have a regular pesky plant segment, but I'm really excited today because we are joined by Jess Slade, who is the native plant collection manager and curator at the Arboretum State Botanical Garden of Kentucky here in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah. And, you know, Jess, it's great to have you on today. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, and yeah, invasive Invasive plants are uh, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I spend a lot of time, a lot of time thinking about them and trying to remove them. So I'm I'm glad to be here and, and share some of what I've learned. I learned to get those really. pigs to eat the invasive plants, and then yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> if only, right? If only. If only. <laughs> All right, Jess, we're looking forward to your presentation. Yes, thank you. And uh, as you get your slides up. Um, you know, I think um, we talk about all things invasive plants on the show, uh, a lot of kind of trying to get you aware of some new invasive plants. But today, uh, Jess is going to be talking with you a little bit about her philosophy to invasive species management and some case studies of different sites that she's worked on, um, which is great because there's a lot of them and how she's approached this issue of invasive plant management, because I know that's one of the really frustrating th things for landowners is kind of, where do I start and what do I do? How do I begin to tackle this huge problem? Uh, so Jess, I really appreciate you being with us today to kind of share your approach to that. Of course, thank you so much, Ellen, for the introduction. Um, uh, so as Ellen mentioned, I'm not going to be talking so much about specific invasive species. I know that uh, this this um, show goes into that detail on that quite often. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing on how you go about managing these um, and how um, specifically you can prepare a, a site-specific invasive species management plan, uh, the process that I follow. Um, when uh, preparing to manage species on a site, and I'll provide some examples uh, as I go through that. Um, let's see, oh, no, here we go. Uh, so first of all, why should we manage invasive species um, and especially plants, um, which is what my focus is today on our site? Uh, some of the major reasons uh, for that are to protect our native plants, trees, and natural communities. Invasive species can really come in um, and uh, affect other populations, uh, push them out, uh, and decrease the biodiversity on the site, especially of those native species. Um, so as we manage these, we can increase the diversity of native species um, and improve wildlife habitat uh, while we're doing that. Um, we also manage them to prevent seed dispersal or spread of invasive species into other areas that might not have invasive species problems yet. And then uh, finally, uh, we protect, we want to protect our recreation areas, um, not just for, you know, getting outdoors um, to do sports and, and, you know, maybe spend time on the lake or, or river, but also just for aesthetic purposes. Um, 
So those are the background of why we do this. Um, and uh, now I'm gonna focus on creating a site-specific invasive management plan. So the first step for this, um, or I guess the overall step is to evaluate your site. Um, so things to consider include how large is the site uh, and what is the state of the natural communities that, that are on this site? Uh, so how degraded are they? Um, how invaded are they by invasive species? Uh, and what is the land use history? So has it been grazed? Has it been logged? Um, when did that happen? Um, and what, what sort of impacts have happened on the site historically? Um, next up, uh, what are the desirable species and natural communities present uh, that you wanna protect? And what invasive species are present and to what degree? Um, what are some of the impacts of these invasive species? Um, and not only what, what are the current impacts, but what are the potential long-term impacts, especially for things that are, are just emerging on a site? And what resources are available to you to manage the site? Uh, do you have you know, a lot of funding uh, and, and manpower labor available for a small site, or are you dealing with thousands of acres and very limited funding? Um, and then finally, what is the likelihood of success in controlling these invasive species, given the target species and available resources? So step one of evaluating the site uh, is just considering uh, different physical characteristics of the site. I really like to divide the site that I'm working with up into management units. Uh, you can do this. Uh, based on different habitat types uh, or based on the topography or um, hydrology of the site. Um, here's an example on the left um, from uh, an arboretum where I used to work, uh, just showing, you know, I was looking at meadows versus riparian areas uh, and woods, just sort of dividing it up so that I can think about these areas individually amongst the site. Uh, other cons considerations include geology, hydrology, topography, um, and features such as streams, trails, roads, and of course, boundaries. When you manage these species, what is on the outside of your property that you don't have control of? What should you expect to be coming in, um, either from a road or railroad tracks or your neighbors uh, who have calorie pear trees on their property that they're not willing to cut down? Just things to consider. Um, and then also, um, I just want to say that there are a few different, I like to think there are different qualities of natural areas, uh, which will affect how you go about um, coming up with a management plan and the different management strategies that you will use on the site. Um, so here's an example of high quality natural area that's relatively undisturbed. It doesn't have a lot of invasive species, although I do see a little bit of garlic mustard in this picture. Um, relatively high diversity of native species compared to other communities. Um, these are the areas that you're gonna focus on first. You wanna protect your best areas first um, before they become a much bigger problem. This might mean a whole site, like if you're managing a bunch of different preserves across the state, um, you wanna protect one that's higher quality and in better condition, or it might mean like I mentioned earlier, the management units, a way of just saying like, okay, I'm going to work in this higher quality management unit and like spend time there before I move on to another area. Um, and here's an example of a somewhat disturbed natural area. So this one is gonna have some invasion by exotic species, um, but also have desirable native species or habitat present. Um, so this is one that is going to be notably tricky to manage because you wanna manage those invasive species that limit the impacts on the things that you want there. Uh, and then a degraded natural area uh, might be something that you either decide to keep as is uh, for its current value uh, for wildlife habitat or something that you just need to start over from scratch. Um, and so you're going to treat this a little bit differently than something where you have um, high quality, or native species present that you want to keep there uh, and not hurt. So this this one and this picture is from a Schwartz Goldenrod restoration site in Robertson County um, that was really dominated by non-native species um, and encroaching cedars. So 
this one was one that we decided to just start from scratch uh, so that we could start with a clean slate for restoration. Um, and this, this one is going to have the most intensive restoration process. Here's another example of a degraded site, um, but that is also valuable um, because it provides important urban habitat. This is a picture from the Arboretum Woods, uh, a natural area that I manage in downtown Lexington. It is heavily invaded and impacted by winter creeper, amongst other invasive species, but it provides really important forested habitat in an otherwise very urban area. And it's a remnant of a uh, inner bluegrass woodland natural community um, that is rare in the state. So we will spend time working on this despite the fact that it is degraded and heavily invaded. The next step uh, that I like to follow is taking an inventory of the invasive species that are on a site. Uh, so thinking about what invasive species are present, uh, it's really helpful to visit the site throughout different seasons. So you see things that are growing in the spring, summer and fall. Um, and then also just consider to what degree, like are these you know, carpets of something like the winter creeper at the Arboretum Woods, or do we have plants popping up here and there? Um, and then what are the current impacts and the potential long-term impacts that these species can, can cause? And when you think about those specific species, it's really important to consider their life history or basically their, their biological life cycle. Um, and because this can inform how you're going to manage these species um, and um, what kind of impact you can have over time. Um, so I like to divide that up into woody species, perennial species, and then annual or biennial species. Uh, these are just a handful. This is an example from Blue Licks, um, a preserve that I used to manage up in Robertson County. Um, some of the perennial species we had there were crown vetch, tall fescue, and Cerisia lespedeza. Because there were large populations of these on site, it was not feasible to go in and mechanically manage these. So we had to think about, you know, managing them with chemicals. While the annual species, the goal was more to reduce seed set um, and slowly exhaust the seed bank and could use mechanical methods for control. And then finally, when you think about these individual species, uh, thinking about whether it's a new invasion or a very established species. Uh, so here on the left, we've got a, you know, a single or a few uh, lesser celandine plants coming up. Uh, we do have these in the Arboretum Woods and you see them around Lexington. Um, compared to what that could become, which is a carpet of lesser celandine in a floodplain forest. So the carpet might be something that you put off managing because it's already to that degree. And also the lesser celandine is going to keep coming into a floodplain um, through the water source that's there. But where we just have a few spot plants, you can really make a difference to prevent that from becoming a problem in the long run. And step three that I like to follow is prioritization uh, for invasive management. Um, and that basically considers everything that we've discussed so far, but also what resources are available um, in terms of funding or manpower. Um, and then also what is the likelihood of control uh, given those available resources? Some plants um, as you research these are going to be a lot more challenging to manage. And, and frankly, maybe just impossible to manage um, given the available resources and may not be worth the effort. Um, so just thinking about what you can actually be successful at. The land manager's toolbox includes things like uh, mechanical management, uh, so mowing things uh, before they go to seed to prevent seed set. Um, we use weed wrenches at the Arboretum, um, so in a small area you can use a weed wrench uh, to help pop a plant or dig it right out of the ground. Um, it's less feasible in a large area where you're dealing with a lot of woodies. Um, and then we also do mechanical management for things like garlic mustard that are really easy to pull and get volunteer help with. Um, but chemical management uh, might be necessary depending on what your site is um, and what your management objectives are. Um, and that can include targeted foliar treatment, 
Um, and then also stump treatment or basal bark treatment of woodies, which, which is extremely targeted uh, with few impacts on other species. It's also important to consider um, indirect influences on these species, uh, not just, you know, how am I going to go in there and kill this thing, but, you know, if, if we change the sunlight conditions, for example, um, either by thinning the canopy to add more sunlight to an area or um, planting uh, trees uh, to slowly shade out the area, that can help um, affect whatever invasive species are on the site, uh, depending on what, what your targets are. And then simulating disturbance through prescribed fire and or mowing um, can have a lot of different impacts depending on the species um, and can be used in your favor. Um, and then finally, introduction of native seeds or plants to the site, um, things that can compete with the species that are there. I just wanna talk a little bit more about fire um, because I, I love it as a tool. I'm just thinking about how it can help um, help or or hurt just change change the situation um it here is a picture of spring growth following a uh, fire uh on an old field site the fire really helped to clear out the thatch so you can really see what's coming up to access things for spot treatment or pulling um, it also helps to um, simulate disturbance and get seed to soil contact of both your native species and your invasive species. Um, and some invasive species will respond favorably as in they love fire and they will explode after a fire. Um, and that can also be potentially a good thing if your goal is to exhaust the seed bank uh, so that you can go in there and do heavier management for a few years after the fire and try to get them out of the system. Fire can also, depending on uh, the conditions of it, help to top gill woody species, uh, things like um, bush honeysuckle, which is pictured here, so that you can go back in and manage smaller plants. Um, it could also be used just to deter seed production. And then um, as far as prioritization goes, some land managers will even rank invasive species for management purposes. I won't get too detailed into this, um, but that process basically involves um, looking at all the things that we've talked about, the potential impact of a species, the current distribution of the species, the value of the habitat that it's invading, and then the difficulty of control. So basically the likelihood of, of success. Um, and by using this process, you can give each species a score uh, that can then be used to rank the species uh, to help identify the species that you should really focus your efforts on. And this I've found to be especially helpful in natural areas or sites where are, there are a lot of different problems, uh, just to try to figure out like where to put your resources because it's just not possible to do everything. Um, and here's just a an example of that in action. So a list of some of the species that I had at a previous natural area that I managed um, and looking at how we ranked them uh, for potential impact, current distribution, uh, difficulty of control, et cetera, and then giving them a priority score. The higher the score there um, meant the um, higher priority for management. And these would really vary uh, based on your specific site conditions. So this is something that you can do just to help you help guide you through management on your site. And then step four, um, after you've looked at all of these different, um, you know, site conditions, uh, invasive species on your site, the current impacts, um, it's important to establish management objectives that are reasonable. Um, based on the current level of invasion and also the resources that you have. Um, and some typical ecological examples or ecological objectives um, across sites, they will vary among sites because there are different threats in different places, um, but include just generally increasing native species diversity, decreasing the presence of non-native invasive species, exhausting the seed bank of those species, um, and then slowly covering the ground with native species in order to prevent reinfestation of those invasive species. And some of the general management strategies that I like to follow, uh, just to reiterate some of these, are, are start with the best areas first. So the, the areas where you can really prevent them becoming from becoming a, a bigger problem 
um, and protect the resources that you have. Um, and then I, I like to start with the core areas and work out, especially because often on boundaries of properties, uh, you have no control about what's going to come in from the edge. Um, and then limiting seed production and distribution. So an example of that might be going in and, and cutting vines that are growing up, up trees just to prevent them from actually producing more, more seed. Maybe you don't have time to, to remove all of the vines from the site, but you can pre re prevent seed production. Um, I like to target plants when they are most susceptible to management um, and then limit damage to desirable species where possible um, and uh, preventing new inv invasions. So emerging species are always prioritized for me. Um, and then follow up management is really important. And finally, restoration planting of native species might be necessary. I like to think in a, a long-term schedule um, because it's not a one and done process. Uh, so here's an example of just a three-year management schedule looking out three years ahead. Of course, it's going to take a lot longer than this, um, but planning for three years is a good start uh, and then adapting management um, as uh, you see the, the site respond. And it's important to set realistic expectations for what the post-management landscape will look like. Um, so here is that site in Robertson County that I said was highly degraded. Um, this one was a, you know, a start over kind of site. So we, we went in there and uh, we started with a prescribed burn uh, to clear a lot of the thatch and help kill the cedars that were encroaching. Um, and then we came back with um, broadcast treatment of herbicide um, and then uh, seeding a couple of years later uh, with native species. So it's gonna be a while for something like this to really look like what you want it to. Um, and it's it's worth it to just sort of watch it through that process and steer it in the right direction. Here's another example of um, Lower Cliff Nature Sanctuary in uh, Fayette County. Uh, they've spent a lot of time and effort uh, removing honeysuckle uh, from the forest there. And here on the left, you can see uh, what one area that's just recently been managed looks like. It looks like death. Like there's a lot of, you know, dead honeysuckle. There's not a lot of green coming up from the ground, but that's just one stage in the process. And on the right, you can see what a similar area looks like three years post-management, where you see some of those early successional native species coming in and covering the ground, uh, notably the snake root, uh, just because it's that time of year, um, but definitely an improvement over the honeysuckle that was there previously. And then I highly recommend monitoring um, as you can um, while you're doing this work uh, so that you can see your, prog your progress um, and, and give it numbers if you can, uh, and then also adapt your management strategies based on what's working for you and your site. Um, this can be uh, comp complex monitoring with botanists looking at vegetation overall, um, but that's not usually doable or feasible for, for most landowners. Um, so you can just look at looking at uh, the numbers or cover of the invasives that you're trying to manage. Or you can just take photos um, and see what they look like as years go by. Um, that can be really helpful just to see the changes. And I just wanna add, close with um, the fact that I think that as someone, you know, it's, sometimes it's very overwhelming the amount of invasive species that we have in our natural areas on our properties. Um, and it's a lot, it's a lot of work and effort, but over time it can be worth that effort. Um, and I encourage everyone to try to do what they can. And that's it. Um, here is my contact information if anybody wants to reach out to me um, or come see the Arboretum and see what we're doing there in the woods and with Ellen's class. Um, that would be great. What? Thank Thanks, you Jess. so much. You know, I think I think one of the the major things that people need to take away from this is that they can't just do this one time and go, I'm done. <laughs> and that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of invasive species. Is that right? 
Yes, absolutely. Wouldn't it be great if it could just be a one and done thing? <laughs> and there's just not a lot of resources for this, you know, across the across the state, across the country. Um, so, and like Terry mentioned, ninety five percent of Kentucky is private land, uh, and so, you know, private landowners are dealing with this on large properties as you know, single people with other jobs. <laughs> I know, and often without the kind of knowledge or expertise they need. And so, you know, what you shared today, Jess, and what Terry shared is really invaluable. So can't thank you enough. And, you know, another thing I wanted to say is I've seen some properties that were just so overrun. You're like you were saying, you just feel like, oh gosh, what can I do? But your approach really does kind of provide this systemic or a systematic approach to kind of getting this uh, accomplished. So um, kudos to you to give us a path out of the darkness um, for one. <laughs> and, and again just a general reminder to everybody it's so much easier to control one or two plants than a whole hillside oh, yeah yeah for sure definitely get those emerging plants <laughs> yeah that's why you can <laughs> well and i think your point of starting with the best and then moving out from there is a really good one too because people can feel overwhelmed i've got to do this everywhere yeah. And, you know, you can start small and move out from there, as well as the fact that, you know, what, what you're doing on one side doesn't have to be the same as what works on another side. You know, each of those is different and your priorities are going to be different for which plants are really problematic and which ones um, can you tolerate better. Yeah. Ellen, oh, okay. uh, Ellen, when is the best time to look for invasive species? Well, it just depends on the species you're looking for all the time. All the yeah. time is a good time to look for invasive species. <laughs> right now is a really great time to look for some of our evergreen invasive winter creeper. Excellent time. We have some spring ephemeral invasive species like lesser celandine that in about a month will be good for. Um, Jess, what do you, what's your calendar? There's a calendar. <laughs> yeah, right? there, there's definitely a calendar. Um, uh, lesser celandine, garlic, garlic mustard is up already. You know, it really varies by the season, what you're looking for, um, and specific, you know, life cycle of each, of each species. Um, but definitely it's good to look for them all the time. Um, and sometimes it'll take at least a year just to really get to know, a site and understand what the problems are. And if you just go out there one time, you're not going to know right. every, like you, you might catch some of them, but like, then there will be some surprises <laughs> like the lesser celandine or, or, you know, things that, that don't really show up until the summer. Um, so, or if you don't know what to look for when they're, when they're um, dried up and dead, <laughs> but <laughs> But slowly, you you get a feel for that too. <laughs> oh, oh. And Jess, thinking about those landowners out there, you know, um, fortunately there are some agencies and organizations available to support our landowners and in invasive plant management. Um, but often these landowners don't even know who they are or how to contact them. So, you know, I'll encourage all of our landowners: don't give up. Um, there is support out there. You know, if you don't know where to start, start with your county extension office, and they can get you pointed in the right direction. But we do have the Kentucky. Division of Forestry, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, and they often work really closely with Natural Resources Conservation Service to get some conservation dollars on the ground to treat to treat in these invasive plants. So there is a pathway, um, you know, but you got to have the right connections. And um, like I said, you showed us a path out of the darkness, Jess. So um, I feel like go forth, people, treat invasive <laughs> plants. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And don't don't be afraid to ask for help from those resources. That's what they're indeed, there for. Indeed. Yes. I can save you a lot of time and frustration for sure. Mm -hmm, definitely. Right. Excellent. Good stuff. Cool. Really good. Thank you, Jess. And Ellen, yep. we appreciate Come you. Come back, Jess. We'd like to hear from you again in the future, you know. Thanks for having me. <laughs> right, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, oh, you know this show invasive all the time <laughs> uh, well you know we're trying to kind of protect our woodlands and our wildlife from all of these threats exactly. you know and certainly you know we talked about big threats to big both threats of those today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes mm -hmm. so you know you can always go to from the woods today.com and we'll see a bunch of threats if you want um we have several and opportunities, and opportunities. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of different videos on there over 100 videos that you could actually watch um and 
uh, some of the ones that Ellen was talking about, like pe pesky plants and things like that. Um, so they're they're there for you to watch, and it, you might be able to scout something out and go, hmm, I wonder what this is, and you might actually find it on our uh, on our video page. So uh, again, just go to fromthewoodstoday.com, and you know, there's also a survey that you can take on That's that. Right. Yeah, maybe you didn't see something you were looking for. Let us know. Um, you know, maybe we can add it as a future show, or maybe you've seen something cool out in your woods, and we'd like to see what that is. And um, so, yeah, interact with that survey. Let us know what you think about the show, what you'd like to see on future episodes. And most importantly, please help us spread the word about the show. We think there's a lot of people out there that would really enjoy it and get a lot of great content from it if they knew about it. So help exactly. them know about it. Yes, thank you. Exactly, because if they don't know, then they can't ask. That's but, right. you know, next week, we're actually going to be talking about what a private lands biologist does and you know what they do and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, and so uh, just just so people will know about that, you know, it's something that, you know, a lot of people may not think about. They really don't, Renee. And so, yeah, please let folks know, you know, we've got some great organizations and agencies here in Kentucky that are really dedicated to trying to help our landowners in the state do the right thing and um, buy their land. And so work with them and um, and they will work with you for sure. Exactly. So um, so we are done for the day, but until then, take care and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. From the woods today.